I'm Doug Singer. I'm the Executive Vice President of Sirion Nanomaterials. Sirion is a leader in the design space for designing custom nanoparticles and the manufacturing of them, usually working in the space of uh, pure metals, metal oxides, and ceramics. But we uh, focus on designing custom solutions for our customers who need particular characteristics in their nanoparticles, and then we shepherd that all the way through scale-up into full-scale manufacturing as a source of supply. I'm going to be talking about the successful scale-up and uh, bringing new products into manufacturing, and that needs to start in R&D. And the people I'm talking to, the message I have is for commercialization managers, the people who are leading pro uh, product development programs, and also the heads of the manufacturing facility who are going to inherit this wonderful new invention, this new product that you've created. They're going to be responsible for making it. And so all throughout that process, the people who are involved in that, the commercialization manager and the leaders, need to go back and work from the beginning with research to make sure you wind up where you want to be, which is a commercially viable product that can be made at large scale. So fail. Fail and just do it. Get it out of the way. You're going to fail anyway. So do it, but fail fast and fail early. If you don't remember anything else I say today, remember those four words. Fail fast and fail early. You're going to learn something from it, and that's the time to do it, because that is when you need to know when you're not going to be going down the right path and when you need to change direction. Second thing is know where you're going to wind up. Know the plant that you can afford to build. We don't have infinite budgets. Know the COGS targets of the product you think you're developing and who the customers are going to be and what their margins they'll tolerate. Know where you're going to wind up. You can't afford to build any plant you want based on where your research made a fantastic product. Know where you need to wind up with your COGS and your plant at the beginning. Then, all throughout the process, channel your research, your product development, uh, the PhDs who are inventing these wonderful new things. Always be steering them toward the easiest possible reality, because that will re result in the, the smallest plant, the simplest plant, the cheapest plant, and the smallest um, manu unit manufacturing costs. So those are the three, three points I'm going to hit on. So fail fast and fail early. No one has ever commercialized anything 100% successfully from beginning to end. So don't think that you're uh, going to be chastised for making mistakes. Do it at the beginning of every step. Do it in research, then do it in development, then do it in a pilot, and then do it in your plant design. Because that's the time when you can nip the problems in the bud, change direction, and cache any learnings that you have. How do you do that in general? When the product is being invented in the lab, when it's being developed in the fundamental scale, find out what it's susceptible to. Probe the product and process space. Try to figure out what might break your product. Try to figure out um, what about the process it's super sensitive to. Find out all those things. Researchers, uh, uh, even at Sirion, tend to find that optimum point and say, I'm going to stay right here. I, customer trade trialed it. We sent it out. We sent them 100 grams, and it worked fantastically. I'm not moving from this tiny little fulcrum of the, the point of optimization. Get away from it and find out where it breaks. Now you've got to push the product and the process until it fails. And then, here's the key to failing early, find experiments that you can mock up very quickly, whether it's in research or you're mocking up development, prototypes of process equipment. Just put together the bare minimum of what you need so that you can get the answer to, is this super sensitive to temperature? Fine, run it plus or minus 100 degrees C. Does it work? Great. You're super robust. Does it fail? How close do we need to get? 10 degrees? 20 degrees? Um, but do it quickly. Just mock it up, whatever your experiments are, and find out if you're going to be in a good space or a bad space. Don't be afraid to mess it up because the speed is what's important. And the, the benefit of all this is you're going to find out where you fail, and you're going to find out what doesn't work, but those four things you find, like oh my goodness, we are super robust and, and we could double the concentration and increase the yield. I didn't think we could do that in research. And the development team said, we just doubled it and, and it worked. Imagine cashing that right at the beginning of your product development cycle. That's what you can accomplish by just going out and finding where you might break the product, break it, and then find out where it doesn't break. So the way to approach this is as a, a, a uh, a commercialization manager or the head of the development team is ask the researchers all the time as you first find out what seven options they're looking at, what their formulas look like, what they think their optimum is, what happened when you doubled the reacting concentration? What happened when you cut the reaction time in half? What happened when you decreased pressure? Um, and 
what do you think broke? What do you think might break if you did that? And it's important to ask the question that way because the, the benefit of this whole process is when you ask the person who invented the product, what happened when you doubled the concentration of the raw materials? Nine times out of ten, the answer is, I don't know. I didn't do that. I didn't want to. I didn't want to get anywhere away from my space. What happened when you ran at lower temperature? I don't know. 850 degrees worked. I'm, I, I didn't go to 400. It's that the answer to the question of what happened prevents you from the asking the question of why can't we? There's always reasons why we can't. We can't move from here because it might break. We can't move from here because the yield might go down. We can't move from here because it might not meet customer specifications. There will there'll always be reasons you, it was done a certain way and they want to stay that way. Ask, what happened when you broke it? And then when they say they never tried it, that's where you find these opportunities to set up experiments, ask them to go back during the product development and pure research and say, cut the concentration, increase the concentration, lower the temperature. Nine of those won't work. Three of them will open up a new door and a new space for you to look for opportunities to improve the manufacturability. And we are talking about the pure research stage. That's where you got to get involved as a commercialization manager or a product development leader. That's where you can catch the improvements. No matter where you are in this process, you, at the beginning, you know what kind of plant you can afford. What kind of cogs can you afford? You might not think so. People think linearly and they say, we're going to find a product that has great performance. We're going to, then we're going to go to the market and find out who wants this. And then we're going to, at the end, like, oh crap, we can't afford to build this plant. You don't want to find that out at the end. And actually, you probably know what you can afford at the beginning. You've got business teams that probably will answer, like, can we afford $100 million for the plant? No. You can't. So dial yourself in and know where you're going to head. That will steer you towards, do you have to find re repurpose existing pro uh, manufacturing plants, repurpose your existing facilities, make uh, as much use as you can to focus yourself and your research to fit where you can afford. And then go out and, and when you realize that, and you look at this and you say, our cogs are going to be way too high, our capital is going to be way too high, it'll take too long to do this. Since you're re finding these answers out in research, that's when you can cash them and go back and say, how do we drive all that down? Um, know the plant and the cogs you can afford. Don't use unobtainium in your research if you're gonna, unless you're going to be selling vibranium. Vibranium is that wonder material in, in the Marvel movies. If you can make a material that defies gravity and um, solves all the world's problems, then charge as much as you want. It'll be expensive as you want. For the rest of us in the real world, don't use unobtainium in research. Unobtainium is hard to, hard to find, expensive, over-specified raw materials, high hazard materials, um, equipment processes that you're inventing a new product and you are hoping somebody is inventing a new high-tech device in manufacturing that they'll be able to produce it. Try not to get in that situation. Hazardous waste disposal, environmental and regula regulatory compliance, um, things that are incompatible with the equipment that you can buy. Sure, you can get tantalum and, and other exotic materials, but um, only go into this space if you really absolutely need to. Don't, don't try to uh, accept something which is five nines raw materials and uh, lots of hazardous process. If you go back and run those experiments and say, we don't need five nines, boom, you just got yourself out of using unobtainium. So know where you got to end up. And then each point, find multiple options whether it's at research, and then you repeat this in development when you're trying to, starting to scale up, you're trying to go to 100 kegs instead of um, two, two kegs or something. Repeat the whole process. Simplest is better. So quickly start with simplest options, execute quick experiments. Did you make the right product? Does it meet specifications? Does the product actually, or does the process actually function correctly to get the right operational tack time? Um, weed out the failures, but at least you know what doesn't work and what does. Um, and then cash out the surprises. You've learned that you can cut, because you asked the question, what happened when you cut the processing time in half? And then you went and cut the processing time in half? You just doubled your productivity in the manufacturing plant eventually when you get there. You learned you can successfully run at lower pressures. You don't need all that vacuum and high pressure uh, vessels. You can get away with off the shelf materials and, and uh, construction of the manufacturing environment that's out there that you can buy from nine different vendors instead of that one that makes the super vessel that you're uh, trying to use. So you can cash those trade-offs. And once you've discovered what you can cash and how you can improve the product and how you can improve the process, circle back. Can you afford that in the plant? Can you afford the cogs? How do they look now? Are you getting closer? 
what else do we need to go back and say, well, we're still we've got a, a bubble here in terms of tack time. We still have a problem in terms of labor. We still have too expensive raw materials. Go back, do some more experiments, and do it again, and try to see if you can uh, weed those out. But maybe this isn't just a winner, right? You, at this point, early on, you do all this, and your cogs are still 10 times higher than even projected in manufacturing. Your cogs are 10 times higher than your customer will ever tolerate. You can't afford the capital for the plant that this indicates you need to build. This is the time to find that out. Go back and maybe even change your whole platform, your product development. That sounds crazy, but if you just stick going ahead and saying, I'm going to make this, this crazy thing work, sooner or later you're going to find out it doesn't work. It's really painful to find that out at the end. When you go to build your plant, when you just ordered $9 million of new equipment, you try to start it up and nothing good comes out of the end. That's not the time to find out. So cycle back. But if it does look promising and you've actually pushed all these costs out and you've made a robust, easily manufacturable product, that's the time to move to pilot and development and do it all again, get bigger and bigger, so that by the time you're making hundreds and thousands of tons of material, you know exactly how this beast performs. You know what it's sensitive to. You know what you really need to control. You know what it's robust to. We're going to buy the cheaper version of that reactor because it's half the price. At that point, um, you just keep refining what can we get rid of, what can we get out of, and how can we make our plant simpler. But again, you're doing that all the way from the beginning. So again, fail. Find out what doesn't work now, not two years from now when you're building your new plant in, um, in perhaps across the country or across the world. Because you know you have some idea, you must have some idea of what you can afford. Otherwise, you will be building a product that cannot be manufactured. Nobody makes money that way. Um, and lastly, that's where you know you need to end up, and you know the way you get there is by failing and trying to understand exactly what you can do and what you can't do, and then always steer your product development towards the easiest possible real reality so that that is the cheapest thing to manufacture, the cheapest plant to build, and the lowest cost, which is really where you want to get to. We need to get from the creative invention all the way to the end of tons and tons and tons of material coming out and uh, supplying your customers with what they need. And uh, just wanted to run through that pretty quickly, but I wanted to really nail home those couple of points. But um, I encourage you to fail. And then fail fast, do it the right way, learn from it, and get better. Thank you.